اللهم صل على الحبيب محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه um, so I'm going to be reading my notes off of my phone, which I usually don't do. So any of you that have my number, please don't send any funny text messages in the next 30 minutes so that I can focus, inshallah, um, and be able to deliver what I want to deliver. Um, you know, the topic of, of Medina and the entire concept, obviously, of discussing what the city of Medina was like, what the city of the Prophet ﷺ was like. You know, subhanAllah, I, I would like to offer some sort of solutions to the issues that we have in our own communities by looking at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. But in the short amount of time that I have, it's really, you know, I'm really not able to give too much. So I think I just want to share a few highlights, inshallah, about that community and what we can take from the Prophet ﷺ's hijrah to Medina and the beginning years in Medina. And I think it's important to mention here that the earlier the people came into Islam, the more praiseworthy they were in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very significant and very important to point out. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا وكل وعد الله الحسنى. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the Muslims before the fatih. Uh, that those who came into the religion and sacrificed themselves and their wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the conquest, and the scholars disagree about whether Fatih here is actually referring to Fatih Mecca or it's referring to Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Um, the majority opinion being that it's referring to the conquest of Mecca. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those Muslims that came in early to Islam are not equal to those that came in after. Because after the conquest, after Mecca was opened, there was not as much sacrifice involved in accepting Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He makes this declaration, and the scholars of tafsir say that the earlier the people came into Islam, the better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى That everyone will have their promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled. Everyone has their own individual status in the sight of Allah. And what that means is, though there might be people that accepted Islam later on, they would still have the same distinction because Allah knows what's in their hearts. And that's why we find that there are people from the Ansar, the people of Medina that actually surpassed the Muhajireen of Mecca. An example is Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I mean, listening to what the Prophet ﷺ had to say about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh from the Ansar, who was only a Muslim for five years in his 30s, and the Prophet ﷺ saying that the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shook at the death of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, that the angels actually carried the body of Sa'd radiallahu ta'ala anhu to his, to his grave. That this man was that beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the Prophet sallallahu to say that about Sa'ad radiallahu anhu is, is, is truly phenomenal. Though Sa'ad again is one of the Ansar. And what's important to point out here as well is that you don't find any of the verses of hypocrisy, any of the verses of nifaq being revealed in Mecca. Because when the Muslims accepted Islam in Mecca, you really weren't getting anything for being Muslim. You know, what you were getting for being Muslim was oppression, was, was being flogged, was being tortured by your master if you were a slave, was being mocked by the elites. You weren't getting any financial dealings because a lot of people, you know, posed as Muslims later on so that they could do better in the marketplace. Well, in Mecca, you might be boycotted for being Muslim. You weren't getting any financial benefits. Things weren't going well for your family because you were becoming Muslim. Your status wasn't doing better. I mean, you were putting everything on the line. There was nothing to gain. Hence Hence, the fear of hypocrisy was not yet there. So all of the ayat about nifaq, all of the ayat about hypocrisy, they start in the Madani period. And in fact, they start in the very first year after Hijrah, Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Al-Munafiqun very early on in the surah. They start very early on in Medina and they go all the way until the last year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Surah Al-Munafiqun and through Surah Al-Tawbah and through the various revelations that refer to hypocrisy. It spans over the last 10 years of the Prophet ﷺ's life because the people of Mecca that embraced Islam, they really didn't have that fear. 
They came into it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else and no one could claim otherwise. Now when it comes to Medina, the Ansar are of the most beautiful and praised people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah praises them in the Quran. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa considered them to be family. I mean the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa praised them in numerous ways. And in fact, subhanAllah, it's very beautiful. And I know uh, Ustad Mu'tasam inshallah will touch on the later Madani phase, but it's very beautiful that when everything was all said and done, when the people that came from Mecca had settled themselves in Medina and the Hijrah was complete and the establishment was complete, and they went back to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ chose to go back to Medina. He chose to remain amongst the Ansar. Why? Because he's telling them that you people took me in, SubhanAllah, and you took nothing but risk, nothing but sacrifice. And so it's only befitting that this group of people be blessed with the presence of the Prophet ﷺ until his death. And in fact, his grave, alayhi salatu wasalam, be in that blessed city for the rest of the, for, for, for the remainder of this lifetime. It's very powerful that the Messenger وسلم, never forgot the favor of the Ansar upon him. But what absolutely blows my mind about the Ansar is that SubhanAllah, they didn't accept Islam for the most part because they met the Prophet وسلم, and they saw his smile and they said, wow, that's not the face of a liar. They didn't accept Islam because they got to witness the physical beauty of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, most of the people of Medina had never even met the Prophet ﷺ. And they were already willing to take him in and bring upon themselves all of the sacrifices that it required to bring this man, Rasulullah ﷺ, into your midst. They were ready for it, though they had never met him. And it's very powerful when you think about it. And there's one lesson that I want everyone to take here. What is it that made the people of Medina go out, the, the majority of them, before they even went to see the Prophet ﷺ, and those that never went to see the Prophet ﷺ, what is it that made them go out in anticipation in receiving the Messenger ﷺ, and not knowing him to the point that when the Prophet ﷺ made the hijrah with Abu Bakr anhu, they could not figure out which one of them was the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, they're looking at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and they're looking at Abu Bakr Radiallahu Anhu and they're trying to figure out which one of them is the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Just imagine being in their shoes. You've been standing outside in the hot sun all of these days waiting to see this man Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and then these few men show up and you don't know which one of them is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and you're too shy to ask. So they're staring and looking and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he sees it inside of them. So finally he shades the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and all of the Ansar rush to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Subhanallah. And you think about that. You know, where was all that anticipation coming from? You know what it was coming from? Because they met the man by the name of Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Mus'ab radiallahu anhu who was sent by the Messenger وسلم, to Medina to set the stage, did such a beautiful job of presenting the message of the Messenger وسلم, that the people recognize that if the product is this, then the manufacturing must be amazing. If this is what the Prophet وسلم, puts out, then we can't even imagine what the Prophet وسلم, himself is actually like, which, is a, which, which tells us a lot. You know, at the end of the day, we can preach, we can talk, we can say that all these things that you see in the media, that's not us. But until we counter that narrative with our actions, whatever we say is insignificant, it's irrelevant because that's the product in their eyes. That's the product in their eyes. And it's important for us to show them a different product. And that's what da'wah is, the counter narrative. Who Muslims really are. What the Messenger وسلم, actually taught us to represent our Messenger وسلم, better the way that Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu did. The way that Mus'ab made the people anticipate the Messenger وسلم, by the akhlaq that he had, by the character that he had, and by the message that he delivered. And there's a beautiful saying that, that, you know, love God in a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to love God through knowing you. Let that one kind of go around your head for a few seconds, inshallah. But it's really powerful. Love God in a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to love God through knowing you. Love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that those who know you but don't know the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa will come to love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa through knowing you. 
It's a powerful message and it's something the Prophet ﷺ instilled in his companions alayhi salatu wasalam. So he comes to this blessed city of Medina and the Prophet ﷺ blesses it with his presence alayhi salatu wasalam and this deeply divided nation of people, of young men. And subhanAllah, most of the Ansar, their parents had died in the Bu'ath wars. And so at, at the first bay'ah, at the first pledge, only three of them were actually over the age of 40. This is a group of young men. This is a group of young people whose parents have already killed each other in tribal warfare. And not only are they willing to put those differences aside to bring about a greater purpose in their lives and to bring the Messenger them into their lives, they're actually willing to, to, to put aside their own differences and accept a new people, a, a, a people that's even more foreign, <laughs> being the people of Mecca, into their homes and to treat them with the utmost love and respect and honor, to put them in their homes, to share with them their wealth, to share with them everything that they had. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They actually loved the people that immigrated to them, that migrated towards them. Think about that for a moment. You guys couldn't solve your issues amongst each other without the Messenger ﷺ and without Islam, though you speak the same dialect, though you are as similar as they come, the only difference is Aus and Khazraj, just sub-tribes are different amongst you. But when Islam came into your hearts, when the Messenger ﷺ became beloved to you, you were willing to put everything on the line to risk your entire existence as tribes because people were going to, to fall upon you now and descend upon you and to accept people that were from outside into your homes and love them and treat them with love and respect. SubhanAllah. That's the power of the love of the Messenger SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and the message that he brought to Medina. And we could talk about what the society of Medina was like on and on. But some beautiful things that, that I take from it that every single day, you can just gather this through the seerah. When you wake up in Medina, your first concern is, let me go find where the Prophet ﷺ is. And if the Prophet ﷺ went missing for a couple of hours, then it became news in Medina. Where is he at? Let's go find him. So you find the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he found the Prophet ﷺ in a garden and his feet dangling into a well. And people were looking for him. Who comes next? Abu Bakr. Who comes next? Umar. Who comes next? Uthman. And subhanAllah, it's almost always this order. <laughs> you know, Abu Bakr, it's even, even the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu where Abu Huraira was feeling hungry and he said, I went out to the, to the path that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions used to walk and I was waiting for them. And he says, فَمَرَّ بِي Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu came by. He says, فَسَأَلْتُهُ عَنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ I asked him about a verse from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that maybe he would feed me. Right? I knew the answer. I just wanted him to feed me. He says, فَمَرَّ فَلَمْ يَفْعَلْ He moved on and he didn't get that I was hungry. Then who came next? Umar radiallahu anhu came next. And Umar did the same thing. Then who came next? The Prophet ﷺ came next. SubhanAllah, it's almost always in the seerah that you find out that if the Prophet ﷺ is somewhere, then his companions will find out where he is and they will descend upon him and they will keep his company alayhi salatu wasalam. And that was the news of Medina. How can we get the company of the Prophet ﷺ? As soon as he comes out of his door, the companions will surround him. They will serve him. They will learn from him. They will share with him their dreams. SubhanAllah, every single morning, the Prophet ﷺ will sit with them and they will share with him their dreams. You know, to get some sort of good news from the Prophet ﷺ, just to engage him in conversation. In fact, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he says that, you know, the Sahaba used to share their dreams with the Prophet ﷺ in the morning, and he said, I wanted to have a good dream so that I could share it with the Prophet ﷺ. Instead, he sees a dream of himself being taken to hellfire. And then the angels say, no, no, this isn't your place. And he's safe from hellfire. He sees hellfire and says, A'udhu Billah. I seek refuge in Allah. I seek refuge in Allah. And he's taken away from hellfire. So he wakes up now and he's like, now I don't want to say anything to the Prophet ﷺ. That wasn't the dream I had in mind to have a conversation with the Prophet ﷺ. So he, asked, he has to ask, he had to ask Hafsa radiallahu anha, his sister, go ask the Prophet ﷺ about this dream. And the Prophet ﷺ knows that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is going to hear the answer. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Ni'mal rajulu Abdullah. 
What a good young man he is. What a blessed young man Abdullah is. He knows that Hafsa is going to take this back to Abdullah ibn Umar. You know, a lot of us, when we hear something bad about someone, we say, you know, الرجل, or, you know that, what, that's terrible. The Prophet said, Ni'mal Rajul Abdullah. What a blessed young man he is. But let him pray a little bit of Qiyam al layl Let him stand up and pray at night a little bit. The Prophet could have said it in a different way that it would have made Ibn Umar shy from him and hide his face from him. But the Prophet didn't want that. He didn't want to deflate him. That was the environment in Medina that everyone was, was, uh, was coming to the Messenger وسلم, was learning from the Messenger وسلم, wanted his company to engage him in whatever conversations they possibly could. Now, when we say that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and, and these great companions, may Allah be pleased and they always found themselves around the Prophet وسلم, does that mean that anyone was neglected in the community, community of the Prophet وسلم? Absolutely not. And subhanAllah, you know, this day and age, when someone stops showing up at the masjid, what becomes the chatter of the town? What do people start saying in the masjid? Ah, la wa la billah. You know, I think I saw him in the mall the other day with a girl. I think he's doing drugs now. I was on his Facebook page and I saw, you know, something in the background and I think that he was probably going to that place. All kinds of weird talk and gossip. When the Messenger وسلم, noticed someone missing in his masjid, it wasn't Astaghfirullah, what's wrong with these people? Go find them and tell them Rasulullah is angry with you and Allah is angry with you. When the Prophet وسلم, noticed that you were missing, he asked about you in a loving way to make sure that you were okay. He cared, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even about those that were seemingly the most insignificant people in his community. And that's powerful. The woman that used to clean the masjid. When did the Prophet ﷺ notice her missing? You know, think about this. If there's a woman that just cleans the masjid every single day, and, you know, maybe after a week or two, a person that's really paying attention will say, hey, did she go on vacation? Is she gone somewhere? Did she get married? Did, where's the woman that was cleaning the masjid? The Messenger ﷺ notices her the very next day. He says, where's that woman that was cleaning the masjid? Not astaghfirullah what happened to her. Maybe she got hired to go clean someone's house and now she's getting paid more and that's why she's not cleaning the masjid. <laughs> None of that nonsense. Where is the woman that was cleaning the masjid? Ya Rasulullah, she died last night and we just didn't want to wake you up. We just prayed janaz on her. She's just the woman that was cleaning the masjid. To that, to the Prophet وسلم, she's significant. She means something. Allah and the Messenger وسلم, noticed her even when no one else noticed her. So even the, the people that were considered most insignificant in the community were, were not necessarily in the, in the prominence of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. They were still noticed by the Messenger Wasallam. They weren't neglected. There was room for them in that masjid. There was room for them in that community. There was love for them in that community. You also see that the message of the Prophet Wasallam was not considered a dividing force in Medina. And this is truly beautiful. Usually when you have a divided people and you bring upon them something new, you'll probably divide them further. Right? They were already divided along these lines. Now throw in a religion and a new way of life. Now you're going to have four different tribes. Now you're going to have four different groups. But the Prophet ﷺ brings a message that is completely foreign to them and no one sees it as a dividing force. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was not a dividing force in that city. It united people. It brought people together. And Imam al-Marwazi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says about this. He says that from the greatest innovations, is to divide the people over something that is mustahab or sunnah. It's a bid'ah to divide the people over something that's merely recommended. And subhanAllah, what do we fight about in our communities? Acts that may or may not be recommended. And we will divide communities and tear people apart. Why? Because this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how it's supposed to be understood. That's bid'ah. That's innovation. Doesn't matter what group you're representing or what approach you're taking to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If you're taking an opinion, uh, you know, and saying that this ref this is what the Prophet ﷺ intended, and you're running people away, and you're expressing self righteousness, and you're pushing people away from the Messenger ﷺ, you are guilty of innovation. The Prophet ﷺ was not a dividing force in his community. The sunnah brings people together. 
The sunnah brings hearts together. It works on people at the, you know, from the deepest levels, at the core of their hearts, all the way to the way that they talk and address one another, to their adab with one another, to the small things that they say to one another. You know, subhanAllah, last night I, I, I was giving a, a class on Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I just found a very beautiful statement from uh, Ibn Sa'ad rahimahullah. He said that people in the, in, back in the days, they used to nickname each other with really bad nicknames. I mean, it was just culture. And in fact, if you were born with a defect, that would be your nickname, or your name would be based on that defect. <laughs> so, you know, subhanAllah, people had terrible nicknames for one another. The Prophet ﷺ gave almost all of his companions a nickname that was beloved to them. He changed it to something good. So he addressed the core of the heart, وسلم, bringing them together. And he addressed the way that people talk to each other, the way that people shake hands with one another, the way that people address one another. The Prophet ﷺ was not seen as a dividing force whatsoever. We also see that the Prophet ﷺ did not tell people to abandon what was sacred to them or abandon their tribes or abandon their families. The Prophet ﷺ knew how much these people loved their tribes, what, you know, what, what pride they took in their tribes, what pride they took in their city and so on and so forth. And Rasulullah what he could have said to them is that actually, Aus, your great-great-great-grandfather was actually like this. Khazraj, your great-great-grandfathers were actually like this. Quraysh, you guys have been worshipping idols for the last so many years. He could have dissed all of those tribes and dismissed them. Instead, the Prophet ﷺ spoke lovingly to all of them. So he found a way وسلم, to embrace their values, to embrace their tribes, without their tribes or their love for their tribes becoming tribalism or becoming means for degrading others or hating others. So we find numerous ahadith in that regard. We find the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Quraysh wal Ansar wa Juhayna wa Muzayna wa Aslamu wa, wa Ashja'u wa Ghifaru mawaliya laysa lahum mawla dun Allahi wa Rasuli. The Prophet ﷺ just started to name all of these tribes. And he said, all of them are my close friends. They are in my protection. And they have no protector except Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ actually brought them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without doing away with everything that was sacred to them before Islam. Instead, he took things that were traditionally used to divide people and he made them means of unity. And subhanAllah, and Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, Rasulullah sallallahu took these tribes and he made them compete with each other in sadaqah. They used to compete over their lineage and over their poetry, now they're competing over charity. <laughs> he took that disunity and turned it into unity and made it productive. And there's a beauty in that, what the Prophet sallallahu was able uh, to do with them. We also see that the Prophet ﷺ was very sensitive to people. He understood that certain people had certain needs and they needed to be spoken to in a certain way. And Rasulullah ﷺ, he honored that. The Prophet ﷺ was sensitive to people's feelings. And that's something that's significant as well. Even the children of his enemies, even those who were once his enemies. So Ikrama radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ikrama, the son of Abu Jahl. You know, Abu Jahl is the Fir'aun of this ummah. It doesn't get worse than that. Abu Jahl has done things to the Prophet ﷺ that are not only unjustifiable, they're cringeworthy. They, they, you know, subhanAllah, just to even read those narrations truly hurts the heart of anyone that loves the Messenger ﷺ. But Ikrama became Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ thought it was important enough to address the Sahaba to say, don't mention his father in his presence. Don't talk about Abu Jahl in his presence. You know, and you can imagine that someone overzealous would say, but Ya Rasulullah, Fir'aun, he's the Fir'aun of this ummah, he's an evil man. We've got to make sure he hates him too. His dad's a kafir. Make him hate his father. Make him talk about his father. It's like the way that subhanAllah, the lack of sensitivity towards those that revert to this faith. Don't go up to people and start telling them, now you have to go home and tell your parents, mom, dad, you're kuffar, I can't talk to you anymore. The Prophet ﷺ is telling the Sahaba, don't even mention his father in his presence. And he hurt me more than he hurt any of you. But don't mention him in his presence. Al-Abbas comes to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ is about to now go to Mecca, Fatih Mecca. And Al-Abbas says, Ya Rasulullah, you know what would make Abu Sufyan happy? 
Abu Sufyan has been at war with the Prophet ﷺ for 20 something years. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ could have said, I don't care what would make Abu Sufyan happy. I've got my own things to worry about right now. You know, we're marching into Mecca now and we're making a statement. We'll worry about Abu Sufyan's feelings later, the man that's been at war with me for the last 20 years. Al Abbas anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, do you know what would make Abu Sufyan happy? The Prophet ﷺ said, What? He said, Whenever you enter into Mecca, Declare his house a safe territory. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Af'al, I'll do that. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes into Mecca and he says, Man dakhala bayta Abi Sufyan, whoever enters into the house of Abu Sufyan, fahuwa amin, he's safe. To, to show Abu Sufyan that he was sensitive to his feelings as well, that he cared for him as well, and he didn't want to degrade or belittle anyone that had status or that had any form of, uh, you know, of, of notoriety in the days of Jahliyyah. However, and I'll end with this, and I see the iPads have stopped. Will you give me two minutes, Sheikh, just to end, inshallah ta'ala? Because I, I, I feel like this is really, really important. And subhanAllah, actually, everything was supposed to be an introduction to this part of the, the talk, but I'm, I was having a hard time <laughs> reading my phone, and I'm like, oh, wow. I forgot to mention that. No, 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 Shaykh. I'm, I'm going to try to take two. Barakallah fiqh, Habibi. All right. Here's what, we're gonna, here's what we're gonna do because this is something that I feel like is very important. I want to ask you all. Was there ever discord in the community of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina? I saw the word utopian in the description of this talk. Was there ever discord in the time of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina? Did the Ansar fight amongst themselves and have tribal, you know, moments where they got up and said Aus and Khazraj and it went back to those days? Yes. Was there ever slander in society of a public figure that led to a very unpleasant situation in Medina? Yes. And what can it all be traced to? The ego of one man. The ego of one man. The pride and the ego of one man can ruin even the most ideal society that's ever existed on the face of this earth. It can bring discord and disunity even to the society of the Prophet And that man was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. When the Prophet came to Medina, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he had Medina locked up. Yathrib was his. Aus and Khazraj were finally agreeing to a king that would lead them and that would prosper amongst them. Then just as they're about to put him in on, his, you know, on his throne, oh, actually, there's a man. He's the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We just gave him bay'ah. We just pledged to him. And instead, we're going to follow him. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul boiled inside. How dare he come and take my position? How dare he come and take what's sacred to me? But he plays it smart. He recognizes that, okay, there's a certain attachment that they have to the Prophet ﷺ. He says, you know what? Instead, when he comes, I'm going to honor him. He offers his house to the Prophet ﷺ when he makes hijrah. Every time the Prophet ﷺ gets up to speak, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul gets up and says, Halumu ila Rasulillah. Everyone come and listen to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Everyone come listen to him. This is our leader. Hada Rasulullah. Why was he doing that? He's trying to maintain his position in his society. In the battle of Badr, when Al-Abbas anhu, the uncle of the Prophet was captured. And he was fighting on the other side, but he was concealing his Islam. So he was just standing still and waiting to be captured. But he was a huge man. And him and Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, they had the same figure. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul said, you can take my cloth to cover him. I'll give you clothes to cover him. Every single time he gets an opportunity to show that, look, we're all good. He does it. But what he tries to do is he tries to destabilize from the inside. How does he destabilize from the inside? He throws a comment about the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the woman most beloved to the Messenger ﷺ. Destabilizes the community, destabilizes the household of the Prophet ﷺ. He waits for one incident, Banil Mustalaq, he waits for that one incident to come and say that you know what? La in Rajana ila al Medina, when we go back to Medina, we will remove or al A'azu, the honored one will remove al Adallu, will remove the humiliated one. To him, in his world view, everything was about him. He didn't care about Medina, he didn't care about idols, he didn't care about his people, he didn't care about religion, he didn't care about theology. He had a disease inside of him that was the disease of pride, which is, disease, which is a disease that would cause shaitan to ruin an entire species, to ruin himself and ruin many, many, many others. 
Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul couldn't get rid of that disease. In his worldview, there is me and there is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did Allah respond to him? That to Allah belongs al-izzah. Wali rasulillah. And to, and to his rasul. Wali rasulihi. Wali al-mu'mineen. To Allah belongs the glory. And to his messenger sallallahu And to all of the believers. And in that is a sign that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, it's not all about you. <laughs> it's not just you and the Prophet sallallahu here. Glory belongs to Allah, the Messenger وسلم, and all of the believers. But in his view, it's all about me. And when a person has that lust for power and that lust and that pride, they will ruin an entire community, ruin an entire masjid, ru- you know, put themselves in situations where they will put innocent civilian populations in harm's way, whatever it may be, to claim their power, to claim their position. Because in their view, it's only them right now. It's just me. And the Prophet ﷺ was told, and this is beautiful, and, and this is subhanAllah, something that I feel like we can take in our times. Rasulullah ﷺ was told, Ya Rasulullah, the man committed treason. The man slandered your wife. I mean, think about it. If someone, you know that saying, that talk about me all you want, but don't talk about my mama? <laughs> like, you can insult me, and I'll smile, and I say, Yaghfir Allah lak, may Allah forgive you. You say something about my mother, Mu'tasim is, you know, going to have to hold me back. <laughs> don't talk about my wife. Don't talk about my mama. Don't talk about my dad. Don't talk about my family. They're precious to me. And subhanAllah to many of us, it's that way too. Like you can say what you want to me. Don't talk about my family members. This man slandered the most precious woman to the Prophet Not only that, he committed treason. Ya Rasulullah, let's just do away with him. Khalas. It'll be acceptable by all standards. Let's just get rid of this man. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He says, لا يتحدث الناس. He said, I don't want people to say, أنه كان يقتل أصحابا. Those of you that understand Arabic, understand how profound the tense of this is. The Prophet ﷺ did not say, as is commonly translated, I don't want people to say the Messenger ﷺ killed his companion. The Prophet ﷺ said, I don't want people to say in the future that he used to kill his companions. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ is concerned with the image of Islam and the image of Islam and the community and the ummah means more to him وسلم, than some petty dispute and some man that can't get over his own nafs and his own pride. The Prophet ﷺ was not going to stoop to his level and the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm not going to give that material to the Islamophobes that will come 2,000 years later and say that Muhammad ﷺ used to kill his companions. They have to misconstrue incidents because they can't find anything unethical on the Messenger not only that, but when the man passes away, his son tells the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, can you pray for him? The Prophet he shrouded him in his garments, the chief of the hypocrites. And this man who was deaf to anything that the Prophet had to say. You imagine he saw the Prophet for all these years, eight, nine years, looking at the Prophet listening to the Prophet meeting the Abu Bakrs and the Umars and the Uthmans and the Ali, those people that we cry when we just hear their names. He was interacting with them on a daily basis, but his pride and his ego blinded him from all of that. And instead, he died in a state of disbelief. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I will shroud him with my garments. Why did he shroud him with his garments? Because remember what he did for Al-Abbas anhu. Even though he did it out of hypocrisy, he gave his garment to my uncle. I will give my garment to him. And the Messenger ﷺ prayed on him. And Umar anhu protested. Ya Rasulullah, this man is a hypocrite. What are you doing? And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Even if you seek forgiveness for him 70 times, 70 marra, and a 70 في اللغة العربية obviously is a kathra, meaning you can make istighfar all you want for this man. مَا يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Allah will never forgive this man. But the Prophet ﷺ rose above the pride and the ego of that man that was trying to cause discord in the community. When there are people in our communities that try to destabilize our masajid and destabilize our communities and destabilize our unity all for the sake of their position and their pulpits and their pride, we should not stoop to their level. Don't become like those people. Instead, we show them that our religion is above that and our unity and our mahabba for one another is above that and our love for Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is above that.